Hi guys, Amber here. Welcome back to Info <laughs> Welcome back to In Conversation with OTF. My guest today is a writer, uh, a cartoon historian, a an all around nice guy. He has won an Inkpot Award, a June Frey Award. He has been the head of a CIFA at one point, if I am not wrong oh yes yeah. for hollywood yeah. oh see for hollywood yeah and he's done loads of books he's been on so many cartoon programs like i know there was a british documentary called 100 greatest cartoons he was on it uh scooby-doo where are you now which was just released last year he was on it well who's he jerry beck hello right. hello <laughs> happy to be here I, uh, I don't know what else to say i uh, happy to answer all your questions. What I tell a lot of people is that uh, I write books so I don't have to remember everything. There's just too much to know. I write blogs, I write posts, I wrote books. So that way it's all there somewhere behind me. But, you know, so I'm, yeah. I'm my blank. I can't tell you anything. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, yeah, you run a cartoon research as well, don't you? Well, yeah, the blog and the Facebook. Blog. Yeah. yeah, that was cool. That is quite cool, to be fair. That's where I got um a bit of my uh, Bill Scott documentary research from, because I know that Jim Caucus has done a few uh, like articles on him and, you know, people have published interviews with Bill and stuff like that. Um, Yeah, me and Jerry have known each other since, I'm presuming... 2020 i think that was when we first started talking and then it was like this bill scott doc- documentary and then like you know we got off to one old steady start like you know like you didn't have anything to contribute to my documentary and that was fine but i was like oh what am i doing and then i started looking really annoying and then now i've redeemed myself <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so, uh, have you- so well you have proved yourself <clears throat> and i and you know we we older fans because that's what i am mm-hmm. I'm a fan like you, but but we've been doing this stuff in the dark. There was no internet, you know. Even even doing books when I started doing my books that I've done, uh, the original publishers back then were like, "Like, who wants this book?" You know, like books about Bugs Bunny. We published them, but they're for kids. We published coloring books and little story books, and like, there's no audience for. There was no proven audience of fans who who would want a book that was a complete, you know, guide to all the Warner Brothers cartoons, you know, who would want this kind of thing? Anyway, uh, we surprised them. All I knew is I wanted it. And if and if I wanted it, there must be some other people out there who want that kind of thing. And um, and that, and like you, you did your Bill Scott. I mean, you, you start with an interest that you have and you uh, pursue it. And uh, at the end of the day, if nobody else watches it or cares about it like like i'm proud of it i don't care it was something i wanted to do and uh, so anyway um you are the next generation and a lot of the work that we did in our my generation we happily passed down to the younger folk to go further which is what i'm excited about what i see people doing podcasts documentaries you know uh, books and video and all this stuff now it's just it for me it's fantastic uh, it was very, very tiny when I started out. Very, very few people interested in this in this subject. Anyway, I'll stop talking. Feel free to ask me a no, question. No, it's okay. I, on this little show I do, um, I, I guess talk more than I do. Because <laughs> I've had well, people call me an airhead in the past and stuff. So I'm like, well, I try not to be. But, you know, also, the guest yeah. is always given priority over me and these. So, yeah. In some cases, I'm your worst guest because I will... I'll try not to, but I, I, I will talk and talk and go, go on and then my mind will get me to some other place and then we'll go on that subject. And so I have to figure out where to stop occasionally. That's the type of conversation I like. Ones that kind of just go off topic and then just spiral out of control and right. stuff. And then I just let the guest talk and then take it in the direction that they want to and everything like that. Um, so, yeah, I'm taking that you have seen a little bit of my documentary, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah, a little bit of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um I'm honored. Um, but yeah, I did have uh, someone recently um, who, you know, criticized like the way I spoke. They actually thought my accent was fake. Really? Yeah. No, you can't take that. I, they were like, <laughs> her, her, her pronunciation of the words were atrocious. It ruined the experience for me watching the documentary. I'm like, and then, and then, and then he, he apologized to me because I caught him out because he didn't expect me to find me on that. Obviously, I'm not going to say yeah. publicly who this guy, this man is, um, because that would make that would just make me, you know, 
I don't, I don't know, because, well, he apologised, so there's no need for me to publicly name him. Um, but then he sent me this video about uh, how, so about a song about British children, how how do they speak or something. I was like, okay. Um, so I am doing a little part two, uh, but that's stuff that I didn't mention about in the last part. And I will speak a lot more slowly. I will try and properly pronounce some words, hopefully do some uh, RP English, maybe insert a little bit of it, um, you know, into the, the audio of my narration. So, you know, I just want you to know that I know, just speaking for myself, uh, we love the British accent over here. We think it's, it's, it's lovely. I don't know what other words to use. And um, you sound great. And maybe, yeah, maybe if you slow down when you do the documentary you know that'll be fine but you, you don't have to you don't have to uh, change the way you speak uh for it uh, you speak fine I, i'm just saying uh, you know you know we can hear every word you're saying and uh as i'm saying this as somebody who hates the sound of my own voice so but you have a very lovely voice and uh uh you know you will uh you, you know that's another thing about here i go uh that's another thing about growing up and growing older and things you you learn. You learn as you go along what's best or how best to do something, you know, yeah. how to approach something, how to write. You know, uh, I feel I got better and better and better as my life went on. And I still think, uh, you know, I, I, I like the way I do things today, you know, whether it's presenting something in print or I teach uh, at several schools. And, uh, you know, it's uh, you just get better the more you do something. And you are at the beginning of your career. And so you're going to get Better yet, you, maybe someday you'll look back at your documentary and go, now I see what they're talking about. But I don't I don't see it at all right now. You're fine and just continue doing what you're doing. We need we need you and we need voices like yours, not necessarily British, but we need uh, we need voices like yours who will champion the, the classic animation and all the little nooks and crannies of the classic animation. You know, uh, that's one thing I love about what you're doing. Uh, and I really think you're you're somebody who follows in my footsteps because um, uh, we all love Disney. Everybody does. You do too, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the thing is, Disney has a lot of historians. They have, you know, many, 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 many books on the subject of the Disney studios, the Disney films, Disneyland, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, but the, it's the other studios, you know, it's the, it's the Jay Wards and it's the Warner Brothers even, and the, you know, Woody Woodpecker and Walter Lance, and I can go on and on and on. They don't necessarily have their champions. Uh, some cases they do, but, um, yeah. you know, I, I, oh, that's why I've always written books. I've, I've have done Disney books. I may do Disney books in the future, but mainly I'm, I do, um, you know, uh, books on other subjects that aren't Disney because that's where I feel I'm needed. I feel like if I don't do it, no one else will. And it's kind of true in some cases in some of the projects I worked on. Um, whereas Disney, you know, the, every nook and cranny of Disney history seems to be examined in a full book. You know, what did Disney eat? You know, there's literally a book like that, you know. So, um, um uh, that said, uh, that said, uh, without going any further, and I haven't really truly begun, but I'm, I do have an idea on a Disney book of all things, because it's something that most of the other historians are ignoring. That's my thing. I like to do something nobody else is going to do. And, uh, and I, my advice to younger uh, historians out there and fans is to go after and researching what isn't already in the books. Go further. Go further with whether it's the animation you love today. Um, uh, it's interesting to me because I consider 2000, the year 2000, a cutoff point for me personally. Not that I haven't watched everything and still been involved. And I've done so many things for the last 22 years. But, um, but for me, history is anything 1999 back in the 20th century. That's the way I look at, at the history of animation and anything from the last 22 years for me. Now I'm older, not for you, but for the year in your lifetime, I don't consider that. That's just part of the modern, the modern what's going on now, but yeah. the modern wouldn't be here if it wasn't for what happened in the 20th century and all the stuff that was done. Now here I am going off, but one of the things I love about teaching is that um, 
I'm teaching students who are all born in this century and, uh, uh, you know, and, and they love animation and they grew up watching the Pixar movies and the DreamWorks movies and uh, Nickelodeon and, and, you know, what's ever on Nickelodeon like Rugrats or Ren and Stimpy or uh, SpongeBob, of course, and others. And the thing is, um, they don't, I'm shocked how they don't know who Chuck Jones is. They never heard of Max Fleischer. They don't even know Walt Disney was a human being. You know, it's just a major company and that's what it is. So are you putting on makeup while I talk? I'm putting on lip balm, sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I always do. I have um, really chapped lips in the summer and also the winter. So um, there you go. yeah, these are just, uh, uh, it's just like a hydration lip balm thing. I mean, I okay, going to quickly confess, I hardly wear makeup. I don't, I don't wear makeup. Well, you don't wear makeup, good. Hardly, hardly. If it's like a special event, like a wedding or a party or, you, you know, something like that, then yes. But going out, normal life, no, not at all. Never yeah. been my thing. I just, yeah. I just put on like a uh, chapstick. Yeah. That's what it's, that's what we call it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, carry on, sorry. Oh, no. So anyway, I was just saying that uh, uh, that's why I became a, a teacher in my later life now, uh, because uh, I first thought it was kind of a joke to have a class about, looney tunes or something and i'm i'm like we're doing this now really and then i go in there and i find out they don't know anything about that i'm introducing them to jay ward and bill scott i'm introducing them to bob clampett and uh, ward kimball and and it's blowing their minds and because there's some so much wonderful wonderful work that was done that isn't being shown even on streaming right now, even on, you know, even on, you know, Blu-rays that still hasn't come out. So, um, you know, that's part of my little life's mission is to uh, uh, to spread the word and uh, make sure everybody knows about it. Um, one of my things, one more thing I'll say about my life's mission uh, was that, uh, and this started out early for me, because um, I... I always watched cartoons. I've watched cartoons. I have stories. I can go back to age five with cartoons. But um, it was my teenage years. And this is a long time ago in the 1970s. In the teenage, my teenage years, uh, at that point in time in the United States, reading comic books and, uh, and watching cartoons was considered kid stuff. And it was really looked down upon in society. It was like, it was, it was just not what any grown up did. And that's when I, that's kind of when I got into cartoons. I start. I looked at, I continually watched them. I was always a fan, but, but then I started to notice that the jokes were really funny in those Jay Ward cartoons and the jokes were really funny in the Warner Brothers cartoons. And I'm like, you know, Hey, I'm getting these in a different way now. And they're really good. And by the way, the artwork is fantastic. And how do they make them move? And that's how I got into it. And I, and there were no books, there were no nothing. There was no internet. There were no videotapes. Things were just on TV. So it was like, I have to know more about it. And that's how I got myself into it. But what I but what I did, kind of a subtext of all the books I've been involved with, all the everything I've been involved with with animation, is I'm also trying to make it clear that animation isn't just a kid's thing, that it's it's for everybody. Classic animation was never aimed at children, it was aimed at the full audience. And um, now we have it better today. It, there's more of an, a feeling of that with SpongeBob or The Simpsons and Family Guy and South Park and uh, Pixar movies. There's more of a feeling of them not being just for kids. But it wasn't like that when I was there. And I, and I still feel I still feel there's a uh, a feeling of the cartoons or the second class citizen in Hollywood, a la Toontown and Roger Rabbit. But um, you know, so. You know, I feel like something we historians can do is to present a good face on it and to make it clear that with intelligence that these things aren't for, you know, for, for little kids, you know, and, I, and I'm not putting down little kids and I'm not putting down great preschool animation, which of which there's many good things even right now um, and has always been, but, um, but animation isn't just primarily the domain of, of, you know, Sesame Street or younger people. And that's that's part of what I try to do when I do a book on Looney Tunes. I want to make, I mean, it's a, a book with almost no pictures in it, you know, but it's it's uh, it's aimed at, a, you know, someone who's a grown up who's who actually cares about this stuff. And um, I try to do that with 
you know, everything. And uh, cartoon research, we try to put that kind of respectable face on it as well. Anyway, there's the end of that speech. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, you're doing a fantastic job. Am I? Am I? Because I really don't know if I of can Of course answer. you are. You, you are. I mean, you're teaching, obviously, like, the next generation of people, uh, all these great um, animators, voice actors, like Jim Frey, Bill Scott, Paul Freeze, and, you know, just... And then they'll tell people who are younger than them in a few years' time, and it'll just keep going down from generation to generation. To- now, Amber, have you had on? Have you had Keith Scott on your show? I have, indeed. Good. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. He's one of the He's a good friend of mine, and he and I can see that uh, you two probably had a lot to talk about. I'll have to watch that one. Yeah. Um. We are talking again next month. It's not an interview for like the series, but it's for the part two of the documentary because i have like oh okay because you know his, his book is about to come out in the next uh few i months. did hear that he's doing a book yeah i have to bring him oh, back well, on for he, that he's been working on his book for before you were born and and uh uh and and believe me it's been long rumored long i mean I, i'm luckily as his friend he he would slip me pages and share some of his research and things all throughout the years but it, it's finished and he's going to put it out there. And he also is putting out there because he also knows that people like yourself and others are going to come in and look at it. And, and if he's missing something or he forgot, he's going to improve the book. You know, there's a point when you write a book, you're like, do I have all the information? Um, you know, you have to stop at some point. And then once you put the book out, this is something I learned early. Um, in fact, in fact, this book came out in 1989. Wow. Uh, but, but. In 1981, and by the way, this is a really ripped up copy of it. Ooh, like a tape all over it. Shows how much, uh, is, um, you know, well, it's just, it's not, not like it shows his age, but, you know, it shows like, you know, how well character. loved it is. Yeah. It's got, it's got character. Yeah. Um, this was the original, this messed up thing here is my, the original book that Will Friedwald and I did in 1981. It's the same idea. It's all a listing of all the Warner Brothers cartoons. But uh, to be honest, you can see why my book has all these little notations in it is, these were all things, errors that we found later, notations from people who wrote me and said, no, no, you made a mistake here, that kind of thing. And we put all those, that information into the second volume, which is this one, which is the real deal. Oh, wow. And, yeah. So I think what, what Keith is doing, and as far as I know, Keith's book's insanely detailed, authoritative, has all the information. But I think he realizes, A, he should put it out already. And B, if, if changes come, he'll he'll incorporate that you know later on and um i I can't wait i mean i can't wait for everybody plus it'll end a lot of people's questions about who was what and and, uh in all these old classic cartoons but they didn't get credit you know so yeah yeah, that'll be great yeah definitely his uh moose that road book was really beneficial to me during research for my book research is it research or research well i say research but i know the the correct pronunciation is probably research. research research how do you say i'm research? just doing some research research i don't know they sound like they're both correct but like but it's fine it's fine it's called an accent and it's 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 again <laughs> uh, there's there's two accents and well, i'm speaking for myself but i think i speak for everybody there's two accents that are just wonderful uh in particular and that's english and uh, british and french and uh uh, but then again, there's so many others that I like. So now that I think about it, you know, uh, and uh, even uh, even Asian. But uh, anyway, I'm going off on that tangent for right. some reason. But I, I like, you know, I, I you know, as a new, I'm a New Yorker. I don't know if it comes through or not. People tell me it does, but I, I'm try, I try not to let it. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'm a New Yorker, and so I, I you know, I, I try to. I, I actually think the New York accent's kind of, well, I shouldn't say anything because I have too many friends. I don't really like my, the New York uh, accent that much. It's almost, it's it's a joke in a lot of old movies, you know, uh, yeah. you know, he's dumb, dumb, you know, that kind of thing. And I just, uh, you know. I can't hear it in your voice. Good. That's a good thing. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. You're I'll, welcome. I'll watch myself. <laughs> I used to read, when I used to read comic books as a kid, and things have changed, but back in the, way back when, uh, they didn't, with some rare exceptions, they didn't put accents in the writing. You know, I mean, yeah, there's exceptions like Pogo or, you know, certain things, maybe yeah. nationalities, they try to put an accent. In. But most people, Superman, you know, and, and Jimmy Olsen, Lois, they, they all, you know, if you just read the strip, it's all perfect English. And, and uh, my brain, even way back when, well, that's how you're supposed to talk. 
you know, just this perfect way. And that's yeah. how I, I, I just self taught myself to just try to do that. Anyway, I don't know if I succeeded or not, but thank you. You did, you did succeed. Of course you did. I mean, with uh, my, well, I don't really call them interviews. I know I say, yes, this is an interview and stuff, but you know, what else do I call it? Podcast episode? I don't know. But it's a conversation, a casual conversation. It's yes. not smart or anything like that. That's what I make sure to tell everybody. It's not smart. Don't dress smart. Well, I mean, you can dress smart. Dress how you feel. Like you can come on it in pajamas or anything like that. Because I've called most episodes in my jammies, so it's, <laughs> it's fine. Um, it's not like... You know, it's not like rapid fire questions where uh, question, short answer, question, short answer. It's, it's question, talk, 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 talk. Another question. <laughs> so, hey, I was going to say that's that sounds like me. Question, talk, 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 talk. But, yeah, because yeah. it's like a conversation. It's like we're literally having a conversation. It's not like, oh, yes, me interview you. It's like we're actually just talking to each other and it doesn't make people feel under pressure or anything like that. Well, well, Amber, then in that case, because uh, I've done a lot of Q&As myself and I'm sure you must have talked to, about this on your podcast, but I'll ask you um, what how did you get into this? Meaning you obviously I'm going to guess you obviously as a younger child, you something got you about cartoons, animation, maybe in this case of the sound of the voices, and you just needed to know more. You just had to know, you were hungering for that, for that. and maybe you didn't see it. Maybe you didn't see that you know, information that you were looking for, and so you decided on your own to research it. Is that, what, is that true, or what's mm-hmm. your story? Um, because I have autism, I tend to have hyperfixations. So uh, I've had a voice actor and hyperfixation since about 2018. So I've been, well, well, to be fair, um, the Hannah Barbera cartoons were the ones that pretty much saved me from depression because I went through a really dark period in late 2017 to around early 2018. It was just awful. Basically, one of my hyperfixations just spiraled out of control and I became just I became ill like and it's hard to describe but you know just I felt like you know it's it's very hard to describe but I just felt so constantly depressed and I was just felt I was just locked inside my own head um I discovered wacky races <laughs> I was like okay I like this and then I discovered all the other Hannah Barbera shows because I grew up watching Top Cat and Tom and Jerry on Boomerang and stuff like that so it's nice to go back to my childhood uh I watched all these I researched his voice actors Doors Butler, Paul Winchell, Don Messick, uh Janet Waldo, June Frey uh and I was like okay I like this and then I got into the Disney afternoon shows I can't remember it was either I got into the Disney afternoon shows which caused me to get into Rocky and Bullwinkle because June and Bill Scott did Gummy Bears or it might have been the other way around. June and Bill went and Rocky Bullman cool. Then I found that they went gummy bears. Sorry, there's a big plane going over my house. You can probably hear it. <laughs> um, so it was one of those ways, whichever way it was. And I was just so intrigued by them. And I thought, okay, maybe I could research more because when you have a hyperfixation you have to study it. You have to get a degree in it for the next nine months. Um, so I, you know, I got in touch with uh, historians. I got in touch. Keith was one of the first people I actually got in touch with. Uh, so I've known him for about uh, nearly four years now. Um, he sent me a, uh, he did like a little booklet that came with one of the Rocky Mullinka box sets. He sent me season two US import with that little booklet signed. Yep. Uh, he sent me that for Christmas. I, I mean, to be honest, I was only 14. So, you know, just <laughs> receiving a gift from a voice actor I loved. I was like, ah, OK, I love this. So and then I ended up going on the radio to talk about autism and stuff and then cartoons. And, and it just it kind of just skyrocketed from there because 2019, I got into more cartoons. I started researching the voice directors as well. And then obviously COVID hit. Um so I was like, OK, I need to get started on this build documentary because I had been planning it from about 2019. But obviously, with me being in full time education, you know, school five days a week, um, I just didn't have the time to make it. But then COVID hit, I was like, well, if everyone's at home and I'm at home. Hmm. So I started reaching out to every single one of these voice actors. Uh, of course, Keith was one of the first people I contacted. Uh, <laughs> so um, and I contacted you as well, because uh, I remember because I remember messaging you. You, you said I think you moved to Los Angeles after Bill died. Is that correct? Oh, uh, yeah. You remember that? The uh, yeah, I only met him once, and it was just a kind of a handshakey thing. Uh, he he, oh, he right. had just died. Uh, look, I moved here in '86. When did he pass? When did he pass away? 
uh, November 1985. I think. Right. I mean, I came in in like April, May of 86. Is when I, I, don't, I sound LA. really but I did, I did. I did come to L.A. a few times before that. Uh, and I did meet him at an Asifa cell sale. They yeah. Used to have. And he was part of Asifa, as you know. He was one of the presidents of that group. And uh, that was... I'm, I'm getting off your topic here, but I, I mean... No, it's okay. June, it was still on June, about Bill, right? June practically created Asifa Hollywood, and Bill was a major part of it. And these were two working professionals where in a, in a profession where most of them, it was... If you were an artist, you loved drawing, and that was it, and then you went home at night. And uh, if you were a producer, it was just a cartoon, it was a show, it didn't mean anything. But these were two people in the field, and there were several others um, who cared more about it than, than, than others, and need, knew that it should be some kind of an international uh, organization, and, and should be there should be an LA one, we should give awards, the Annie Awards, and... Um, uh, they did a lot to promote and to do what I'm, I've been doing since. And that's probably why I gravitated to ASIFA, which is to raise awareness to the public that animation isn't just the babysitter and just and just a kid's thing. And yeah. that's what that's what it was all about. And anyway, I met Bill for two seconds at a cell sale and it was very impressive. I figured he'd still be with us even when I moved out and uh, he wasn't. And uh, but um but June became a very good friend of mine in the last, especially in the last 10 years or so of her life. I, mean, I knew her, you know, probably more than that, probably 30 years, but uh, in the last 10, I, I, I'd i like to say we were friends a lot. I talked to her a lot. She would call me, I would call her, you know, about different things. Um, uh, she had a lot of, of life in her, um, right up to the end. Yeah. Um, um, the, uh, uh, you know, she, she was, uh, a lot of people fought hard for her to continue her roles as granny in that late, that very late uh, Tweety and Sylvester CG short that they made at Warner Brothers. And uh, and, and also, as you know, in uh, uh, the, the Rocky and Bullwinkle short that they made at, at DreamWorks. And um, uh, it was it was quite a struggle because a lot of the, the younger people who were running the, the studios were like, well, can she still do it? You know, and, and there was a lot of issues involved with that, but but uh, as long as June was alive, she still did. She still worked a lot, as you know, with Mark Evanier, uh, another person. Did you did you interview? You, you had okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for the show and my documentary. <laughs> no, of course. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, it's just really interesting. I came out to LA at a time. Of transition, I, I would actually argue, and a lot of my friends, we have this kind of diner conversation about the end of the golden age and the beginning of what we think is today. Um, and and uh, and I'd I'd argue that eighty six, eighty seven was smack dab in the middle uh, because so many things came out of came out the minute I moved here. You know, um, the Simpsons started their interstitials on uh, Tracy Ullman. American Tale was in production and then came out in 87. Um, uh, what am I forgetting? Uh, the Disney Renaissance began in that universe. Uh, of course, Roger Rabbit in 88 um, and uh, Little Mermaid in 89. So there was there was this new thing happening in animation uh, in the late 80s. Mighty Mouse on TV and, uh, and then soon Nicktoons in 1991. So things were really, really moving. The, what I call the future was beginning to happen just as I got out here. And the past was still here. And um, it was just an interesting period to be out in L.A. at that time because the past was still there very thick. But the new was coming in. And uh, anyway. Yeah, it was slowly like fading because it was around like 86, 87, 88, 89 that we lost Dawes Butler, Mel Blanc, um, yeah. Jay Ward, Paul yeah. Freeze. Everyone was just, just slowly passing away. I mean, it's just. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I like a lot of people. Uh, I only met Jay Ward once at his store, you know, uh, the Dudley do Right Emporium. Oh, you met Jay? And the uh, uh, that store was there way into, I want to even say, I can't remember what year it was. And I think I have a photo of this somewhere on my Facebook page, but when they, when, when somebody else bought the store, the store closed and, it, and it, they were going to demolish, not demolish it, but they turned it into a new business. Um, someone tipped me off to the fact that it was, they were just taking it apart today and they were going to, uh, you know, 
And I went over there with a friend and they were taking the sign that said Dudley do right Emporium off. And we basically said, could we have the sign? And we, we got it. We got it. I, it's, it's in a Cephas warehouse. It's wow. Really cool. It's this big sign with Dudley do right on it. It says Dudley do right Emporium. Yeah. And I'll we, have to we, come we, see it. <laughs> yeah. I have a picture somewhere. Uh, Cause I think I took pictures that day. Anyway, I've got, I'll, I'll, I'll dig that out some, somehow. I, I mean, I documented, if I wasn't going to get the sign, I wanted to take pictures of it going away. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's that kind of thing. As you know, of course, I, I guess we should mention my, my good friend, Will Ryan, who passed away uh, last November. And uh, did you ever talk to him? I wish you had. Of course uh, I did. Of course did. Okay, I good. did. Good. Okay, oh. good. Sit down. This is going to be a, a good story. Um, right. <laughs> Katie Lee put me through to him. He does. I don't think he had like a mobile phone. Like he just has like a normal uh, landline. Uh, right. So people struggled to get a hold of him. I know uh, Camden Spees, who we both know, uh, he helped me on my documentary and he's a wonderful historian. He uh, struggled to get Will for his June Frey, uh, like, because I think he did like a book or like a project on June, I think. I can't remember. Maybe. But oh, um, Camden, Camden did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I got talking to Will. He helped me so much. Um, I just the first call with him, I kind of had I was in a bit of a hurry, so I feel really bad for that because I was like, okay, I've got to go. And I'm like, I'm so I just felt so guilty. Um, but uh we we interviewed and stuff, and not only did we do that, we actually kept in touch. We would occasionally video chat every few weeks or months during the pandemic and talking about, you know, anything British or anything to do with Wales, as in the country Wales, I still have souvenirs in my drawer that I forgot to mail to him before he passed away. So mm. I'm going to try and give them to his wife, Nancy, um, if, when I get over there, because I have a trip to Panta Merca in the spring, so to California. So <laughs> you me, let me know. Um, so right, let us know when you're here. Yeah, I will do. Yeah, I'll have to come and see that big sign that you've got in, in the warehouse. And, oh, and also, because they got the yeah. statue back on Sunset Boulevard. Right. Yeah, and um, so Will, he was just amazing, and he actually got to see my documentary before he passed away, and I didn't even know he had cancer when he was, um, you know, doing that, and I interviewed him for my uh, in conversation with ATF. Um, the day he died, I was, well, I found out the day before that he was, you know, he was definitely going to pass away in the next few days, and I was just in so much shock, and then he passed away. And I just felt, I just felt like all happiness just drained from my body because I felt like I just lost a really good friend who I promised him we would meet, but we never did. And just the fact that you said to me, Will's left a little bit of himself, um, of his personality with me, that actually made me cry. I, I feel honoured. Will, Will was a great guy. We were close friends. He was the first person I first new friend I had when I moved to California, he introduced himself to me at, a, at an ASIFA meeting. Oh, and, uh, yeah, because he was at ASIFA, wasn't he? He was one of the... Was. He was also past president. And we uh, yeah. we were colleagues, friends, went to the movies. I mean, you know, we did we did a lot of stuff. And uh, I found out from Nancy later that uh, that I was the last person outside his the very small circle of Nancy and his his manager and a few people who were actually at the hospital with him. But I was the last person that he spoke to outside them. And, uh, and, and it was about a CFN. and it was about the fact that he's left uh, some money to give an award every year, a Will Ryan award. We're going to do that. Oh, wow. And it's going to be uh, for aspiring, uh, you know, uh, artists. Um, uh, we're, we're still defining but I know Will, you know, I think he means everything. Voice artists, uh, physical drawing artists, uh, could even be historians, I, I knowing Will. So, uh, but we're, uh, we're going to be giving a Will Ryan Award uh, at the Annie's, uh, probably starting, it, I have a feeling it's going to be in the very next Annie's in February. So, cool. so, so that's, uh, but he, he will live with us. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, I can go on and on. I could just do, we could just do a whole tribute show to Will sometime, but that's, uh, but that's he's a sad loss, and I can't I can't stop thinking about him. I can't stop thinking Same. about his phone calls because I I heard him on the phone. I didn't see him in person, and I heard he was in very bad shape and 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 a lot of bad things. And um uh, but he on the phone, he's I mean he had a gravel in his voice, but he sounded he was Will. He was Will. He was still Will. Yeah. And we still joked and talked, and 
he was still there. He was there right to the end. And so, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, that's, for me, it was the best way for me to remember him, you know, uh, is just the way you see in the pictures and his podcasts and, and, and in his voice, which is the last thing I, my you know, contact with him was through his voice. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll, yeah, he left behind so much stuff that people will be, people like you will be researching Will and what he did, you know, for years and years. Cause I think he did way more than, and, and even let's, let's people know. I don't, <laughs> more things than are probably on his IMDb that, you know, that he probably did. But anyway. Yeah. This is hard. The last time I spoke to Will was probably August. Um, he said to me, well, it was I was like, oh yeah, you down for video chat because I got you some merch from that long town name in Wales. Um really long, don't don't ask. Um and he said maybe in a few weeks or months I'm going I'm going on vacation. Turns out vacation was chemotherapy. Oh. Uh, and obviously I didn't know that well. Casey Lee told me after he passed away that it was chemotherapy that he was going through, but I just didn't realise he had cancer. Like, when he was doing... When we were talking on Zoom, when he was... I was talking to my channel. I need to re-watch that interview because, like, you know, you just don't notice, and I know it was, like, a very immediate circle of friends who really knew about his diagnosis. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to get, like, a little voice message to him in his final days, but, of course, that wasn't possible. But I just hope, like, you know, I thought about him constantly after he said he was going on vacation. And bless my heart, I was waiting for him to come back. Mm. I mean, I miss getting his emails. I still have his email. I still email his... I still email him regularly and just, you know, not expecting a reply. It's just out of character for him because he'd always reply um, a few hours after I'd send it. Bless him. Yeah. Um... So he was a president of ASIFA, right? Mm-hmm. At one point. So you're, you, were you a president president of ASIFA? Yeah, you, I mean, every or... every uh, bunch of years they changed president. We had a, there was a period where we had a president for like 20 years, uh, wow. a fellow, but um, um, now we have term limits. So I was president for six years and I'm still a vice president. I'm in charge oh. of uh, film preservation, which is one of the things we do. And uh uh, we also do screenings um, and uh, we do all kinds of things locally in L.A. The big thing we do that's national or international is is the Annie Awards. And I hope you'll watch uh, if you haven't seen it before, because it'll be on. It's streaming, uh, you know, when it's is live. It streaming? Yeah, I think you can even watch. I think you can even watch the old or the last the last year or twos might even be online somewhere on YouTube or something. And it's like it's like two or three hours. But. You, you get a lot of a lot of the voice actors come on and uh, do the presenting. It's very much like an Oscars, except it's for animation nerds, you know, but uh, a lot of names that every all people in animation know, but people outside of animation never heard of. But um, it's pretty cool. It's 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 very well produced. And, uh, you know, uh, and it's June Frey came up with it. Yeah. And yeah. yes. Oh, yes. That's why there's a June Frey Award. She was always a presenter until she couldn't present anymore. And actually, I think she was a presenter right until I think she died in between the last time she presented and wasn't there the next year. I mean, wow. she was always, she was always a presenter. That's uh, so cool. Wow. She was like the queen. She was our queen, you know. So when was the June Frey Award introduced? Was it reintroduced after her death or was it introduced before? No, she no, was it was, like- it was introduced. Uh, she was around for, I can't say a fan off the top of my head how many years, but uh, not only was it named for her, but we, we, we had her, give it we had oh! her to somebody oh, like wow. me, a, you'll find a photo of me on uh on google or somewhere of of june handing me my my wins my uh, june Frey award that's how yeah. I, I, I mean i don't i don't know i haven't i'm saying that i think it's there I, i'm sure i posted a picture of it on my face it's on google I have um, to find it. if i knew how to do this fast enough oh well i found it i would, I would I dig it, up it. And show you but I found it. if you search up Jerry Black June Frey Award, it's one of the first yeah, results yeah. that comes up. Yeah, it should come up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but wow, that's just so cool just to look back. What year was that, if you don't mind me asking? I think it was. <sighs> I, ha- I have it in the other room. I could go, go and get it and I can hold it up and it has the date on it. I wanted to say 2015, but that Let's seems have a look. too recent. That seems too recent. 2008. I- and eight. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That was like 14 years ago. That's- yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm 
you learn, you'll learn as we go along. Time flies, you know. Um, the um, you would have also enjoyed, and I'm sure you saw some images from uh, the the June for a tribute we did at the Academy uh, out here at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. I've she heard was, of it. He was the one. There wouldn't be uh, a best animated feature Oscar if it wasn't for June and. Um, and uh, so we, between the Academy and Asifa and Mark Evanier and me and Bob Bergen uh, and um, who else? I think I, I want to say there was another, uh, I'm forgetting somebody and it's bothering me. I think it was four of us who put this thing on. Uh, Bob Bergen. Was it Keith? No, Keith came. Keith flew in from Australia to be there, which I'm glad he did. Um, I think, was it oh Nancy gosh, Cartwright? I'm feeling, I'm feeling very embarrassed that the other member of our quartet that put that on. Could have been I, Nancy Cartwright. No, no. I mean, she, she was there. Um, you know, again, I, I don't have immediately to pull out the, the little program we did. I'll figure that out later. But we, but we, everybody, everybody, loved, everybody loved June and everybody cooperated. And we had guests and we had clips. And um, it was just a, a really fantastic event. And I don't know if it was recorded whatsoever. I think it was. I think it was. But I, that's a wow. You know what? I, I got to figure out. I got to find out where that spot. You have it. That was five. Five of you. You were five. No, no. no. I, well, I, I was 13. Uh, but uh, no, was that? Yeah, I was 13. No, there was five of you guys who put it together. Oh, tell me the names. There was you. There was Mark. There was Bob. There was Howard Green. Yes. And Tom Sito. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Is it Sito? Is that how you pronounce his name? Sito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sito. Yeah. 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 Hello, yeah. That's Howard me. Green. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, literally, it could have been a, a, a 35 people because there was so many. Everybody cooperated. Everybody wanted to be part of it. We all did a lot of work to make it happen and to be as cool as that's why. So I hope it exists on video. And I believe it does. I'm going to have to look into where that is and how anyone could ever get it. It needs to be shown again because uh, it was really, really special we had great special guests and uh um i think lily tomlin was there i'm trying yeah. to remember we had some amazing people there and um uh and and we showed clips on the big screen at the academy like you would never believe we showed like a dudley do right episode in 35 millimeter film and wow. everything we had was fantastic we showed rare clips of her we showed the very few clips of her in live action movies or tv shows oh yeah yeah Let's have a look. And, uh, oh, movie was there. Debbie Derryberry. I'm just having a look at the picture here. Oh, everybody was there. Daisy Daly, Gray Delisle, Laurie Neiman, Teresa Ganzel, Candy Milo, Carrie Walgren, uh, Laura Summer, I think, Katie Lee, Rusie Taylor. Yeah. That's all I can recognize. If I've left out anyone, I am deeply sorry. <laughs> it's such a small photo. I can't really see who's in it. But, you know. Um, Wow, honestly, that yeah, because I did, I, I, I did hear that um, from Keith that there was footage of it, but it's not been put online. But I'm like, oh, I want to see it. I remember, I remember, even in the week or two after it was over, we were all very concerned about getting it out and making it available. Oh yeah, because of all the licensing from different stuff. That yeah, but you know what? It's been like how many years now? And the, five. And we, and we all kind of dropped the ball on on trying to bring it back. I'm going to revive that. I'm going to try to make that happen. I want, I want people should see it. Cause it was put really it out on cartoon research. Yeah. And it wasn't like, it was not boring. Now, that's another thing. It's really, really entertaining. You could do it next month for a fifth year anniversary for the tribute. Cause it was on her birthday, right? Which is in September. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah you're September, right. 2017. Well, yeah. I got to first find out who has it and <laughs> what format and figure out all I that I think stuff. Keith would probably be, the first person to ask and then well no actually no the other four guys you did it with ask them and then maybe ask you maybe i, I, I don't know but you know or maybe ask one at C well, i, I think don't, i, I don't somehow know. think mark evanier has knows where it is one way or another I yeah think he's, he's, he's probably the best bet yeah, yeah. I'm sure well honestly like i've i'm a little bit of a voice actress myself i've done okay. a few things as i said the corner was right there uh, i've done a theme park ride uh for a place in america um the, the thing is breaking into the animation industry like actually getting on a cartoon and stuff thinking about it is actually just quite hard i mean i'm making a demo reel and now i've got to split it into animation and commercial um sending it off to a u.s agent and because like I've been told not to fake an American accent, just do a British accent, um, because they love British accents, of course. 
But then someone pointed out, well, the time difference, eight hours, like what if they have a 5 p.m. recording session, you've got to stay up till like 2 a.m. or something to do that. Mm. Or like if they've got, they have to do one, like something, I don't know. But And then you got to join uh, SAG and then you got to see if the agent that you're interested in will take on international people or you have to live in Los Angeles. It's just all too confusing. I just wish it was that simple. Or like, if you get a, U- a UK agent and they'll pass you US work, I don't know. Like, I don't know. It's really, it's really hard. I mean, I've learned because of knowing Will, because of my wife Cheryl, and uh, you Cheryl know, I've, got, yeah. I've gotten a close up look. I also was involved with uh, anime dubbing back in the uh, oh. 1989, 90. I I had a company. I don't know if you know any of that. Uh, Streamline pictures here in the US and we dubbed a lot of Japanese anime. Oh, yeah, you did the My Neighbor Tozaro uh, dub that Shadow did. The original, did. yeah, the original version of that. And yeah, we did a lot yeah. of stuff. We did a lot, a lot of things. And uh, we so much, I mean, it was like three, four, five years for me, you know, involved with uh, dubbing and uh, and other aspects of doing that, that company. But I got to meet a lot of the voice actors, at least the ones who were working on anime then. And of course, I met other voice actors in later years for a lot of things. And I mean, I, the thing I say to people, and I'm no expert and I'm nobody to talk to about it, but, but uh, one thing I do know from knowing Will and knowing Cheryl is that um, uh, you got to be an actor first. You got to really learn acting and then, and then, and not, and don't be like, people always think, Oh, I've got a funny voice. I can do cartoons, but, but uh, you got to learn, you got to be an actor first. And then, and then the, how you enact that role is second. And um, the, the other thing with Will, uh, the ones that work a lot, uh, this goes for anybody in time, whether it was Mel Blanc or, uh, and Bob Bergen today, or, uh, you know, and Cheryl, and all, the one thing they all have in common, and the reason I'm not a voice actor is uh, for a variety of reasons, um, is because they, can read the, the script they can me- remember it pretty well quickly i mean it's still going to read it when they're doing the, the the acting in that case but still they can read it they can retain it uh and they're they they're they don't do this usually but they could do one take uh, now yeah most places will do two takes to, you know make sure maybe three but um but a lot of these people are like one take re- they're they can do it perfectly in one take and yeah. People don't realize that's what it's about because the producers are looking at their watches. They're looking at uh, money, budgets, time. We've got to get this amount of stuff done in this, in this time and this today. So they're looking at, you know, how much it's going to cost the rent they've rented the studio. So actors who can do a great performance, uh, not, not fast in the way they talk, but, but they can just get it in one line, two lines, two takes okay, we got it. Let's move on to the next one. And, you know, that kind of thing. And those are the people, that's why they hired some of the same people over and over and over. That's why Tom Kenny works a lot. That's why any of those great names that you've mentioned work as often as they do. They're, it's what we call professionals. They're professionals. They know how to, they know exactly what to do and how to do it. That's a factor that's not really taught. I don't know. I don't go to voice acting classes or anything, but it's, it's the thing that people don't hear. And, um, you know, uh, it's all important, but if somebody truly wants to be a voice actor, you really have to get into it pretty deeply. Cheryl's an actress first, you know, um, and she specializes in doing her, because she happens to have naturally a high voice. She sounds naturally like a a little girl. Ah. So so she actually puts it on to sound like a a grown-up, sound like an adult. (laughs) Like, if you've ever seen uh, Ren and Stimpy, she's the the, the wife, the miss, we call it Mrs. Pipe. She's the, uh, in many of those episodes, they'd have these characters that you only see from the waist down. Ah, uh, yeah, like in Tom Billy and Jerry. West, yeah. Mr. Pipe, this is a pipe that comes down and she's the woman. And, uh, but that's her doing her grown up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know? wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but you know, it, uh, she gets a lot of great gigs doing uh, babies and, you know, Google, Gaga, ga, you know, that kind of thing. And, yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's just, she's kind of a specialist in, in what she does. Um, now that said, now I happen to be, you know, having this little company called Streamline Pictures. Mm-hmm. We did a lot of dubbing and every once in a while, 
we'd have in the script, you know, soldier A, you know, has two lines, you know, jump out of the plane, you know, I'm going down. And like, you know, we say, you know what, I can do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And <laughs> me and my partner would do these, these, these little soldier A, soldier B type voices in the background. And, um, uh, you know, and so, you know, yeah, I, I, I can't really point you know, I did that and I did this, but I, I did a lot of voices, uh, but they were like little nothings. They were little, you know, one liners, you know, that yeah. are totally forgettable. But uh, but I so I was trying. I even remember being nervous doing it. And because and, also we had to match the mouth movements and we were dubbing, you know, we were doing uh, what they call ADR, automated dialogue replacement. Yeah. Well. Well, that- and uh and uh, so I had to match the mouth mouth movements and someone like, oh, my God, I can't. That's when I also learned I can't do this. You know, I did it, but I, it's it's I don't want to do it. You know, it's not my thing to do that. I love the people who do it because they do it so well. And um, yeah, it's it's but it's it's I'll tell you another one quick other story. It's a Cheryl story. It's just that one time I was meeting her. This is way back when in the uh, you know, we met in 19. Uh, we met in like 1988 or so, 88, 89 is when we did that. Oh, Tokyo. wow. And, um, and, then, and then Rugrats was 90, 90, 91. And somewhere around there, we were dating. Uh, we dated a lot uh, throughout our lives, uh, even though we both went off our separate ways and we came together finally. But, um, but the, uh, uh, so I, I, I remember picking her up at the Klasky Chupo studio and, um, and just, you know, they basically she said, you know, walk in, here's the entrance, just tell me waiting for me. And um, I'll tell them you can come through or something. And I go into the doors and the Rugrats have already been on TV. It's already established. I, and I know the voices, you know, I know the, how it sounds on a cartoon. And I'm listening, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, that's funny. They're playing a Rugrats cartoon as kind of like, you know, like, like Muzak when you wait on a phone. When you're on phone, and you're waiting, and they have like a, like some music you don't care about. And I'm thinking, I'm sitting here in the reception area of Quest Jubo, and they're they're playing the soundtrack of a Rugrats cartoon. And then the receptionist says, "Oh, you can come, you can go right in." And it's that that sound of the cartoon is still playing. It's the babies. It's all the babies, and they're talking and they're doing. And I, as I walk in, and they're still doing, I'm still hearing it. And I walk into into the the producers area, you know, behind the glass of the recording studio, and right in front of me is the four girls doing the dialogue I was listening to in the reception area. And they're, they're doing it live right there. They're actually, you know, they're, they're just reading the script and doing it, you know, in character. And I was like, wow, it blew me away. I mean, I knew there were, the, the, there were these adults who did kid voices and I knew there were other actresses and I knew everything, but I never saw it happen in front of me. And it was a surprise. It was like a complete, you know, uh, it wasn't like I was sitting there. Okay, let's. You want to see them do it? Here we go. No, it was already happening, and I walked in on it happening, and I thought it was so cool to watch them record. Uh, it was really. I mean, it suddenly made me think of all the other things. Like, oh, gee, it, could you imagine doing that on Rocky and Bullwinkle or or any of these things? It would be amazing to see this. But so I had my one experience like that where I actually saw that. You know, I mean, all those Hanna Barbera shows. Uh, you know how cool that would be to be in the room when they did it. And there I was in the room in this one case, the only other time I went back to the studio. Cause I, I like, I, you know, I give everybody's got their space. I know how it is. I'm not going to be, you know, hanging around just, you know, for my own experiences. But um, I told Cheryl called me one day and she said, uh, uh, Adam West is guest starring this week. And now Adam West, you know, from Bat, I grew up with Batman. And, you know, I said, Adam West, he's my hero. I mean, I love Adam. I go, you, you, I got to come by. You just let me come by. And she says, I'll leave your name. And like, and so I came in, I saw Adam West and Cheryl doing, and I took pictures. I think she posted them. I took oh, a wow. Of Cheryl and Adam West. And uh, maybe a picture of me and Adam West. I'm not sure if I posted that one, but they're not that good, the photos, but because I had a crummy little camera. We didn't have phones like we do today. But um, uh, but uh, but I did memor- we do have a shot somewhere of Cheryl with Adam West and uh, from that day. But but um, he was he's on one episode of the Rugrats. So it was it was just but it was killer to be able to see that. That was another another high watermark in my uh, <laughs> that must have been so cool i mean i've um i i've only met one voice director i'm not sure if you know of him kelly ward 
know the name. I don't think I met Kelly Ward. He was Potsy in Greece. Oh, uh, yes. I know who he is now. Yeah. I, I, I definitely, I definitely the- never met him. And by the way, that's a great. I love that film. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Me too. Um, yeah, he's done a lot of cartoons, uh, mainly Disney. Um, I met him. He did his first ever convention appearance in Liverpool a few months ago. I got to meet him. He was oh. amazing. Look, everyone else was there for Greece. I was there just because he was a voice director. And yeah, he's invited me to one of his sessions if they ever get back to in-person sessions. So just to be there, seeing probably one of my favourite voice actors in the booth, just doing that, say, for example, if Corey Burton's at a session, just sitting there in the room and just like, okay. <laughs> Like, you, have to, you have to get you have to get uh, uh, Cheryl and I booked into a Comic Con in uh, England and let them pay our expenses to come on out. But you know they get double whammy. I can yeah do screenings and Cheryl can be from the Rugrats. And- yeah, yeah, of course. I think Wales Comic Con would probably be your best bet because it's that. And then you got um, and you got that- MCM. Oh. Go is that the big one? Uh, the big one I would say is MCM followed by um. Well, Monopoly events have like Comic Con, Liverpool, Edinburgh, Manchester, Wales, and stuff. Then you got uh, Wales Comic Con, which is in Telford now. Um, they that's where I met uh, Kevin Conroy, Batman. Have you seen Batman the animated series? Batman, yeah, of course, I love that show. Me too. Yeah. It's my new hyper fixation. So, <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, that's the show. Although I have to say, because I'm a big comic book nerd, and I, I, at least from the era that I grew up in, but the um, Batman the animated series. But I have to say, as much as I love that, my favorite of all those shows was the one, I don't know if you watch all of those shows. I, I kind of don't, but I my favorite is the one called Justice League Unlimited. I've Great. heard of that. That's, it's real. It's like, to me, that's the best uh, of those Batman shows. But Batman, the animated series is a classic unto its own. And I totally, I love it. And uh, anyway. Great, yeah, because I'm trying to I'm trying to get a few uh, just sweet voice actors on my show, you know, like George Newburn and Susan. Oh, they had they had some, yeah, yeah, they had some. They actually had a lot of famous people as voices uh, on occasion, and uh, yeah. yeah, Paul Dini is a friend of mine. Bruce Tim is somebody. Else. Oh, Paul Dini, I've tried to get him. I think um, I think he was too busy. Like I remember his like publicist got back to me. He was like, uh, yeah, he's currently busy. Um, so I was like, oh, I'll check back in a few months or something like that. Yeah, I've tried. You know, because obviously Batman's really had fixation. I've been trying to like reach out to every single cast member, and I have gotten a few. I think. Uh, well, I got Tom Ruger, who obviously was like oh, yeah. one of the developers of the series. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah he's really nice and uh who else did i get uh i don't think i've managed to get a lot of people no i'm trying to get diane Persian, who was uh poison ivy uh kevin conroy is unavailable around leicester um i'm trying to get him um and you know we just got mark hamill there's no way i'm getting him he turns on every podcast because of how That's all oh, true and he's all he's all he's very famous still now of course even yeah. more than he has been but I will say that I have met Mark Hamill several times. Oh my gosh! He's a really nice guy in real oh. life. And he's really, and as you may know, he's a comic book collector, and he's a Is he? he's a fan. Oh yeah, he's a fan. Oh my gosh! He's, he's a fanboy, just like me and me and you. Uh, yeah. But he's uh, that's how he, he, you know, he was always that way right from the beginning. And uh, um, he's all I can say is he's cool. He's 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 one of us, and he's cool and. Uh, it's not impossible, I suppose, although I have to say his star, it seems to be a little higher than it was uh, even 10 years ago right now uh, because of the new Star Wars movies, because of the things he's involved with, plus all the other voice work he does. He's, he's, he's pretty hot right now. But it was a time, it was a time, I would say, 15 years ago or something where, you know, I would say his star dipped a little bit. He was still Mark Hamill. He was still doing voice. He was the Joker. He was, you know, he was on Broadway. I mean, I, I mean, it's silly for me to say that, but his star's pretty has risen a lot in the last yeah. five, six, seven years. And uh, uh, but he's still a real good guy, and I, I, I think he's great. I mean, I, 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 I happened to meet him. I won't. These stories may be boring. Uh, to me, they were. Uh, oh, I wouldn't meet him. I met. No, I just met him. I met him like. Um, at Comic Cons, I even met him once at uh, Paul Dini's house. I went to Paul Dini's. Oh house. wow! But he, and he, he, but I'll say this: uh, he, when I first met him, was that I was at a Comic Con in New York, and I was selling, <laughs> I was selling junk, old comic books and junk, and I was just hanging out, and um, 
and he came to my table, but he was in kind of slightly incognito. I forgot how. And, and I, I recognized him and, um, and I said something to him about, Oh, oh my, you know, I'm, you know, I'm nobody, but you know, I'm, I'm, I didn't have this with me, but I said, I'm Jerry Beck. I, I did a book on Warner Brothers cartoon. It was around this time, like 81, 82, 83. And he, he said, Oh, I have that book. Oh, I love that book. You're Jerry Beck. Oh, that's great. And he was like, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and then um, similarly, a few years later from that, um, I was at San Diego Comic Con, oh, and I was, and I was, I love this story. To me. I, I don't know if I can impart it the way it happened, but uh, uh, I'm talking to my friend who's a dealer who's selling all kinds of tchotchkes, and he's like, he's another good guy. He's selling a lot of, you know, uh, you know, just I can't even old comics, old toys, that kind of thing and uh, magnets of things and my friend is my friend and, and this guy comes to the table and I think he was wearing a hoodie or something like that and I recognized him and I said oh hey Mark Jerry Beck and he goes oh hey Jerry you know like that kind of thing and um and he's asking my friend how much is this this and this and he goes and he's my friend's looking at him askance like well I don't know um, um I, and I, I go to my friend okay Give this guy, as my friend, give this guy a deal. Just give him a deal. I'll explain later. And he goes, well, and he goes, to, he goes to him. He goes, well, because you're Jerry's friend and he says I should give you a deal, I'll only charge you, blah, blah, blah. I gave him a big discount. And so and he, and he did. And then he walked away and I told him, that was Mark Hamill. <laughs> and he goes, what was? You know, and, <laughs> that's my story. It was just, I love that. I love that uh, that my friend didn't see him, didn't didn't look at him in his face, you know, didn't see who he was, you know. And then I had to get him a disc. I got Mark Hamill a discount on some old comics. <laughs> That's so cool. I mean, the last time he did a UK appearance was probably Star Wars Celebration, which was about 2016. And one of my friends went, and I um, I'm jealous. I want him to come back or at least I hope he goes to San Diego next year because I'm trying to get to San Diego Comic Con. That well, it's hard to explain really. I have three trips planned. The first one is to use a flight voucher that runs out in May. The second one is to do San Diego Comic Con, and the third one is for the publicist opening the grand unveiling of the theme park ride that I mentioned before. Uh, so <laughs> all three trips to California. So you know, well, wow. I'll, I will say this on behalf of a lot of other of your guests who could probably do the same thing. Um, if you, if you, I don't know what arrangements you have to make to go to Comic-Con, but if you need to get in, if there's a problem getting it, you, you know, I, I can get you in. So, so I would, I would, I would get, I'd give you, I'd get you a badge. I can do that. That's one, my one superpower. Can't get you a hotel room. I can't fly you out. No, but it's fine. Honestly, it's fine. uh, You know, and the thing is, you know, that's anyway. Uh, I'll leave it at that. So don't worry about that part. Like, like I couldn't get tickets. No, that's not an issue. issue. In fact, when I think about it, all the people you interviewed, like Mark Evanier, everybody could get you a ticket. People, some people have said they can get me in. I'm like, who do I go with? Who do I go with? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you will definitely be able to get in if you just let us know. You know, one of us will give you a ticket. Oh, thank you. Be really, because um, I, I think I spoke to Mark and he was like, uh, you can pick a voice actor for one of my panels when you go, and it can't be Frank Welker or Corey Burton. I'm like, okay, um, (laughs) Mark Hamill. I was like, well, he was like, no way. That wouldn't happen, I don't think. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, Peter Cullen, nope. Just McNeil, nope. I don't know. Well, of course, you've met Corey and Frank Welker. What are they like? Uh, well, get ready. For, see, I told you. I t- get ready for disappointment. Um, I don't even know <laughs> if I have met Frank Welker. You know, you know what? Wow. I, probably, I have met him, but not in any social way. Yeah, 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 it yeah. It was yeah. like, you know, he was maybe uh, getting, uh, giving an award or getting an award at... Uh, oh, yeah, he got a Lifetime Achievement at the Emmys in 2016. Right, right. But the thing is, half the time I'm backstage and I am meeting everybody and half the time I'm in the audience and uh, I'll be honest, I, he's a legend. But obviously, I know that, uh, clearly. Knows that. But, uh, but formally meeting him, I, I have to say I have not done that. I don't have any stories or so there you go. I don't, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. It's, it's worth weird, an ask. It's weird how I, it's weird who I do know and I don't know. It just, just hasn't, sometimes you just, the circle doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah. it's all right. It's all right. Um, I just thought I'd ask you a few final questions before we wrap up this interview. Well, okay. conversation, if that's okay. Uh, 
What's your favorite color, Jerry? It's my favorite color. Actually, I, strangely enough, I'm wearing my favorite color, which is a blue green. Oh, that's good. Oh, nice. One. A lot of people do say blue. It's quite a common answer. I like blue and I like green. And then I realized I really like blue green in between. Uh, I'm not sure if you could try and guess mine. <laughs> yeah. Yellow? Yep. Yep. Always oh, been my favorite since I was little. That's so. supposed to be a Pokemon headset or something? Oh, no. It's just generic cat headphones. But as you can see, they're probably just so close to snapping. I'm probably going to have to get another pair. In fact, oh, hang on no okay there's a little story i can kind of slide in um you know who andrea romano is right yes but i barely have not met her so go on with this okay life. well at least you know who she is and you, you know yes. have an idea what shows she's done like a lot of the dc animated can was just as yeah. unlimited um we had a galaxy cotton chat the other day uh i spoke to her uh and we got on well i mean i i mean camden had already gave, given me her email and we'd obviously corresponded for about two years around the same time i started talking to you um mm-hmm. then we obviously we finally got to meet virtually and you know she wants to do a comic con over here and stuff and then i got an email uh, like a few hours after the chat saying i love your headset thank you for the inspiration i've ordered a pair of for my, for myself <laughs> that's great yeah, and she sent me a picture of her wearing them. I was like, oh, my gosh. I was over the moon. I was, That's I, great. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I have her permission to post it publicly, so obviously I'm not going to display it on this interview, but I will probably show you afterwards, Jerry, because, you know, okay. it's a yeah, blessed yeah, image, you know. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, here's uh, my final big question. Yes. What's your ideal weekend activity that's not anything to do with researching cartoons? <laughs> That's a good question. <clears throat> That's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer for it exactly. Uh, I mean, does, you know, I really, I'm really boring. I mean, going to the movies would be my favorite thing if I wasn't trapped in my room here. Uh, we luckily, I luckily have a, a pool. I'm, I can't believe I'm saying that, but I, me and Cher live in a house with a pool and we do like to go swimming, which is great. Um, it's hard to imagine that, but yes, uh, let me see. <laughs> Uh, 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 you know, I mean, I just, I, I mean, we, uh, as I've gotten older, you know, I do appreciate the finer things in life, you know, like walking in a park, you know, yeah. things like that. And yeah. I used to, you know, you know, I mean, I, I've done some active things that I can't, haven't done in years still, like riding bikes and uh, things like that. But I think, uh, you know, I, I don't know, some super simple stuff, you know, uh, you know, walk, it sounds so old walking to go somewhere to get something, which uh, as an ex New Yorker is very difficult here in LA. Um, but uh, those are simple pleasures, you know, like, like that. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, my whole life has become what used to be someone else's or my uh, pleasures, my hobbies, my pastimes, you know. Um, yeah. It used to be you had to work, I had to work, you had to work somewhere do all kinds of stuff you didn't care about. And then you can go to a Comic-Con, you know, now yeah. my whole life is like a Comic-Con, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and that's what, what happens. You, you believe in it and you really, really try. And it's just kind of in the back of your mind and you wish it and you wish it. Ultimately, as time goes on, it becomes real. It becomes what you can do. And I say that to you and I say that to anybody listening that, you know, just don't give up. You know, I know I sound corny and I know I'm giving you like philosophy and everything, but you know, don't give up. Keep keep doing those things that you like to do that you want to pursue. If it sounds crazy to everybody else, just do it. Just do just satisfy yourself. Everything I've done here, I go pull, holding up that book again, if I can find it. Uh, everything I've done is also <laughs> to satisfy myself. I mean, I didn't start doing this to make money. I mean, and quite frankly, a lot of money didn't come out of this. But um but, uh, uh, you know, it's, this was something, it was, this, had, this was an itch I had to scratch. You know, I had to, I had to know this and I had to know that on several other book projects. And, uh, and then what happens is, let's say you don't make money on it, like your documentary, you know, let's say you don't do anything. The thing is, it's, what's the right, I don't know if I come up with the right term for what it is, but what it is, is it's gravitas. It's, it's something that, you can hold up and say, well, I wrote this book. And you know what? I'm, I'm teaching now. I'm teaching like six, five classes at the five different schools. Uh, I get paid for that. That's my ma- main livelihood, to be honest, right now. Uh, but I also do consulting work for the studios and stuff like that. And why do I do that? Because I've written these books, you know, because I did all this stuff that I love. 
And, and it's ultimately snowballed into giving me a whole life of doing stuff that I love. And um, so I say that to do that yourself and, uh, and, uh, and to anyone listening as well, uh, you know, cause it, we're all better for the kind of work you're doing. You, Bill Scott documentary. So we, you know, we are better people now. We are better people because you did that because we know more about Bill now. Thank you, know, you so, so much, Jerry. Oh, bless you. Oh, I completely forgot to ask about Scooby Doo. Where are you now? It says at the top of the screen we got like four minutes remaining. So in the quickest That's perfect possible. because I don't have much of an answer. What's your question though? What was it like to do? I know you were approached to do it, but I wonder what made them approach you. Like I know there's tons of more people in the world, but they that you. documentary. You yeah. mean that documentary? Well, that's the funny thing. I'll, well, I mean, Gilbert to... Gottfried knew you, so of course yeah. everyone knows you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the well, the funny thing with the Scooby Doo one. I think you would have loved that. My podcast, my uh, Bill Scott documentary. To be fair. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, you know, I did that book on the Hanna Barbera Treasury. I hope you have a copy of that. You have that book? No. My God. Oh, I'll order it. I promise, I'll order it. A whole double page spread on wacky racism. Oh, oh my god! We do. If you want, I'll hold it up. I know we only have a few minutes, but it's a book I did a few years ago. And I, I, but what it, more importantly, and I was involved with this. I, I picked like the images and pictures in it. Hold on one second. Oh, uh, you know what? I'm not going to be able to get it. But um, it's fine. We can restart the meeting if you want. No, 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 uh, no, 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 no. Uh, the Hanna Barbera treasure. I did this fantastic. Well, here it is. I'll stick it on screen. <laughs> you do that. Yeah. Um, now the cover is the worst part of it because the cover had to be approved by Warner Brothers, and they were aghast at the images on the inside that I selected because I selected old merchandise images, and many of them are off model, and they didn't want any. Oh my God, that doesn't look like Fred Flintstone. But the thing is, the images are cool. You'll see when you see the book. Anybody opening the book buys the book, and. Uh, the cover is using all the stock on model images that, uh, that Warner brothers would approve. It was too late for them to change anything by the time they saw it. Anyway, I did this book. There's like a double page spread or so on every character up to Scooby-Doo. And we have a lot of merchandising images. It's that's not a good description of this book. And then what happened is the publisher came out with little mini versions of some of the text from the book. And I have almost nothing to do with it other than my name is on these little little books. One of them is a Scooby-Doo. One of them is a Flintstones. They, in fact, they mean even two Flintstone books like that. And they put them out there. They're not, I don't recommend those books at all, even though my name is on them. It doesn't mean anything. And because there's books out there with my name and it says Scooby-Doo, that's cool. Uh, that's how I got called. I got called by the producers of that special. They said, oh, well, you wrote one of the books on Scooby-Doo. And I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, not really, but all right, you know, I mean, <laughs> kind of. So uh, I said, listen, same thing I said to you. I said, I can't talk about like every episode of the pup named Scooby-Doo and the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo. But, if, you know, I can talk about, you know, Scooby-Doo's importance in the, uh, you know, in the whole of animation history. And yeah. I said, that's fine. That's what we want. Oh, these are, this is going to be boring. It was recorded just in an office building. Oh, so it wasn't like on the Warner Brothers. Um, uh, no, something. no, it was in the production that's office. Boring. Of the people. No offense, obviously, not to you. I mean, to the people. Yeah. The <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, well, the people who were producing that special had offices, you know, uh, on Coenga Boulevard, kind of opposite kind of across the street from where Hanna-Barbera used to be back in the golden age. Yeah. And, um, and they just, it was just in their production offices and they literally sat me down in an office and they turned on a camera. I mean, that was, it was pretty simple and it was, it's pretty boring. It wasn't at the, on the Warner brothers lot. I have done, you know, uh, some of those uh, things that people could see on uh, the, uh, the golden age of Looney Tunes discs or some of the Hanna-Barbera uh, DVD collections where they have me as a talking head on a documentary. Some of those were actually at Warner Brothers Studios. You know, uh, oh. you know it's, 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 I've been on that lot many times, uh, oh. but not for Scooby Doo. You're lucky though. What about that hundred greatest cartoons uh, one? That British documentary from 2005. I was surprised to see you on it. To be fair, well, no, it was and obviously talking about records. Probably looked really, really young. I think the one that's called the hundred greatest uh, cartoons. Um, yeah, the British one. It is. I'd have to see where I am in that uh, in that one. I think that one was shot in my apartment. Sometimes, a lot of times, I'm on camera. They actually bring the crew to my office or my apartment or something like that. It's weird. It's like wherever they can do it, you know. Um, 
I, I mean, I probably could name a dozen places, you know, where things have been recorded, little studios, movie theaters. Uh, a friend of mine has an animation art gallery. We've ah. recorded things with that. So I have animation art behind me, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just wherever they can find it. It's very, very much how filmmaking is done. It's not as glamorous as people think it is kind of done, you know, wherever they can do it, you know. Yeah, I haven't watched that documentary since. Uh, for about two years, I've been meaning to finish it off, but I honestly can't remember what uh, what show or movie was was what spot, so I'm going to have to rewatch the entire thing. And then I'll just, like, message you, because I remember talking to Billy West about it back when I spoke to him for my documentary, and I was like, oh, yeah, you're on this program. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, I just, I mean, they record, they come in and you record with them for, like, hours. They set up for an hour, and then and then they talk to you for an hour and a half. And, and then, then like two minutes gets into the final. Product. Or less. I just saw myself in this new uh, Will Vinton claymation documentary called Clay Dream. And uh, it was in a movie theater, and I, I know I was in it, so I went to see because I wanted to see myself on the big screen. And people had told me, oh, I saw you in that film. And I thought, wow, I must they must have used a lot of my, my whatever I said. And they I think I'm literally on camera for less than a minute and, and, uh, but you, but they had dialogue for about a minute in advance cut to me and then more of my dialogue, you know, while I had some other images on. So I'm barely in it. And that that's normal. In fact, I was in a Ren and Stimpy documentary that came out and they, they shot me a lot, a lot. They even did uh, uh, what they call B roll of me going through my, uh, my, my garage and my, my, my hidden Ren and Stimpy stash of artwork. And um, I'm not even in it. They, 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 they completely cut me out of it completely. They, they told me they're going to, if, if it comes out on DVD, they'll, they'll have a bonus thing with me. But um, uh, I don't know. That happens all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm like um, frequently uh, being asked for interviews and I do them just because, you know, you never know. Well, with me, I won't cut you out. Uh, this is this is probably uh one of the longest interviews i've done because i think we've done over about an hour uh-oh oh no I not uh-oh at all talk no. too much i talk no. too much no it's <laughs> fine because a lot of my interviews are only like 40 45 minutes and i know if i told camden oh yeah i only spoke to him for 40 minutes he'd be like, oh, how do i know minutes. see if i knew that i didn't know that they're usually 40 45 minutes if i knew that i would have started well, stopping talking in 45 minute range well, it's not really that. It's just if we run out of stuff to talk about, I just stop it. <laughs> if I cover everything that I needed to cover. Um, I know the longest one I probably did was with Wally Winger. That was like an hour oh, yeah. and a half. We ended up talking until like the hours of the morning for me. Um, but about the documentary stuff, there is a similar experience of what happened to me. This was like uh during the pandemic it was about a theme park opening like you know how it just it's a life after the pandemic um film crew went around the, the park with me all day with a camera and interviewed me oh. and stuff and had a uh a, a like a gopro with me on some of the roller coasters but the gopro actually kept falling off oh. so not only did they cut out any all the gopro footage um well they they wanted me to do a callback interview at their office in manchester i never got the call back oh. um and then I got a phone call a few weeks before it was there saying, uh, we've been taking the decision to cut all of cut all of your footage from the documentary. Oh. I'm like, what? We filmed over two hours worth. What? And then I watched the actual documentary itself. I was only on screen twice. There was one bit where there was a bit of silence and you can, well, there was one security guard talking. And then, as you said, like uh, his voice and then a, a different picture. It's just a picture of me standing there in a mask. Um, I think I was waiting to get in. It was only on screen for about five to 10 seconds. And then there was oh. another one of me near the end having my photo taken near one of the statues. And that was only about um, three seconds long. And one of the, right. One of the people that they decided to focus on in the documentary, because they focus on like different families. It was this, I think, I can't remember, honestly, it's been a long time since I watched it. It was like a boy or a child or a teenager. Um, and then as soon as they said the line, such and such has autism. I was about to fucking throw hands. Oh. I was like, oh, that's so annoying because I told them I was autistic as well. So I've always wanted to be on television, not to be famous or, any, famous or anything, but, you know, just I've always wanted to play an autistic character, no matter if it's in a real life documentary or like if it's in a, a, fact, a fictional TV program. Um, I know there was this one soap opera I uh, auditioned for who were looking for an autistic character and the person who ended up getting it, um, their parents are famous, so they pretty much fought to get their child the role. 
and I've tried it with other programs and stuff, but they just, I'm either too young, too old, or just not what they're looking for. They're not the perky little girl that they want with autism. And when they do have a character with autism, it tends to be male. Well, it's it's less common with females. Yeah. And it's just, oh, it's... Oh, it's we'll honest. be fine. You're going to be fine. You just keep doing what you're doing. I want to make my own show. I want to make my own show. I'll write well, it. You're going to have your own show. You're going to be great. The um, <laughs> thing I wanted to say <laughs> The uh, you know, if, if, if anybody wants to, I think this is online, but there was a show here in the United States called History Detectives. And I'm in an episode of that. Look up Jerry Beck, History Detectives and see if you can find, I don't even know. I think it's online, but that was the most, I won't go on on this, but, but that was the most interesting experience I had because I thought it was another one of these shoots and they wanted me to meet them in a theater. And they, I thought it was going to be 10 minutes. I thought it were a half hour or an hour. I didn't think it was, it was, eight hours with these people and but i'm in the whole thing i mean or i'm in a lot of it that's wow. why and it, actually i like i like it's one of my favorite ones that i did but boy when i drove to it and i got there i was like you know i just figured i'm gonna have lunch in an hour i mean i, I was there for eight hours and it was wow. angles and uh then we had went into the movie theater and we faked uh showing a film on the screen it, it was a video but we made it believe it was a film and we held up and we talked in the theater and we talked on a terrace and we ended up it's, it, anyway, it's, I won't go into the whole of it, but it's uh, it's about classic animation. And uh, uh, that's one of my favorite of these kind of shoots, because mainly because I'm in it more than I, and the other thing about it, if you do see it, is that uh, I remember watching it. It was the first time I said, oh, my God, I gained so much weight and I went on a major diet in the last next six months. Not that I'm I don't know what I look like now, but. But I, uh, but I think I look a little heavy in that. But if you, but the History Detective is one I do recommend if anybody wants to see the best of Jerry Beck. There you go. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh yeah, I, I was gonna ask that company. Could I have the the cut the footage at the cut and they never got back to me? I just want that. That would have been a good idea. You yeah, know, I would have got it. I would have posted and, it on YouTube, made my own. I know, and you know what? You got to ask them when you have the chance because a lot of these companies will do that. They'll give it to you at that time. You know what I mean? But like if it's six months later or longer. It really, you know, nobody wants to go looking for it. You got to ask them at that time. Yeah, yeah. I think it did ask and never got back. But it's probably going to be very unlikely, but I will probably, yeah. I will email tomorrow and I know the problem won't still have it, but it's worth an asking. You know, it could be in their archive. I don't know. Um, but yeah, with that, this interview ends here, if that's okay. Well, I don't know why I said here. I don't know. But yeah. Yes. Jerry, where can we find you on social media? Uh, do you have a website? Do you have a blog? Yeah, I have a website, cartoonresearch.com. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, that's kind of a blog. It's me and a whole staff of uh, like-minded animation historians, different articles every single day. Uh, and there's 10 years worth of uh, previous ones. So if you're new to it, whoa, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, uh, I'm on Facebook on, uh, well, you can try to get me on Jerry Beck uh, Facebook or, or Cartoon Research Facebook group. Uh, I also handle, I uh, kind of am an administrator on several other Facebook groups for classic cartoons, you know, old TV cartoons and mm -hmm. tunes and things like that. So, you know, go for it, look for it. I'm on Twitter a little bit and that's really it. Uh, those are my main handles. So hope to see you somewhere. Yeah, I, I think I follow you on all of them. So that's all right. Yeah, sweet. Um, Jerry, you've been lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for giving me your time this evening. I don't know because My it's about uh, 25 past seven over here right now. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Great, Amber. Yeah, and to you at home, thank you so much for watching this interview. Well, casual conversation, should I say. Stay safe, stay happy, be kind to yourself and to others. And thank you for watching. Bye. And cut.